So I'm Suzanne Murtha, and I've had the pleasure of being here now for an hour or two, and so I want to take a minute to um, tell you something that I observed about the folks that I've met here. So um, I went to Villanova University, and it was um, a lot of um, uh, spoiled rich kids. <laughs> and that's just how it was. Um, and, uh, and when I came here, I met a lot of folks over the past hour who are just, uh, who are not, who are hardworking and who are, um, and who are really trying to take advantage of um, an, op op an opportunity for education and who you know, clearly are, um, have wonderful ethics. So I just wanted to let you know that I, uh, um, I'm sure that, it's, that this is really hard to be here in the evening. And I can just imagine that that's a challenge for um, people who aren't spoiled rich kids. <laughs> and um, it's that ethic and, and that approach to life that makes me want to hire you. So when you need a job, please um, reach out to me because I don't want to hire, uh, I want to hire people who are working their backsides off before I want to hire someone with a degree from Harvard or from Villanova. So please come to me and tell me that, uh, and tell me that you were here and how hard you worked to get here and because um, I want to hire you rather than someone with a fancy degree. Okay, so thank you for giving me the privilege of being here tonight and meeting you and talking to some of you because I feel enriched and so thank you. All right. Um, so oh, here's what I do. So Atkins, so um, I'm going to give you the setup for how stuff works. So governments, governments basically, uh, there's like a, uh, they're, they're like an iceberg. And how they're set up is there's generally like one subject matter expert in the technology and then they have a whole bunch of um, consultants who report up to them. And that's sort of how it works across transportation and healthcare and all the different government entities. So you might have like one guy in the office and then that guy has a pyramid of people underneath them, okay? So, um, and our staff at Atkins staffs that pyramid of people underneath them for several different governments. So we help them, I help governments, federal and state and local and cities and counties and all that understand things that they need to do better or help, or help their staff. So my expertise is in connected and automated vehicles. And I got here as an, an economist. I was an economist for the automotive industry, so I got to know everyone who does that kind of work. And um, so I, I got to bring in some of the automotive industry to this new technology. All right, so, um, and now I help the federal government. I help U.S. Department of Transportation, Georgia DOT, and um, many of them throughout the country, but that's what I do here when I'm here. Um, so I'm going to talk about connected and automated vehicles. You've probably never heard of connected vehicles. You've probably heard of automated vehicles. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the difference between them. And if I get boring, please interrupt me because I know that a lot of you are supply chain management people and don't do what I do. So please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. I'm supply chain and I'm also in technology. So I source for technology. So just, just saying this. So we're good? Yeah, we're good. Okay. <laughs> so stop me if we're not. I don't mind being interrupted, okay? Please redirect me, okay, if I need to be. All right, so, um, so we have connected vehicles and automated vehicles. And in this picture, this is going to be the automated vehicle. Uh, this is the connected vehicle, and that's the automated vehicle, okay? And the difference is that an automated vehicle is a vehicle um, that has some aspect of the driving task managed by a machine instead of by the driver. So from my perspective, an automated vehicle, a lot of people think self-driving, like there's no driver. But, and that, that is one type. In the meantime, we also have um, automated braking and automated um, uh, parking, and there are all kinds of tasks that are automated, and that's all part of um, uh, what goes on in, in how. The interesting thing is that for the automated side, which is the sexiest side, which is the part that everyone wants to be a part of, is that I'm not, I don't make cars. So really, there's not a big role for me in that, and there's not a role for our governments in that. So actually, I don't do a lot of that. But that's the sexy thing that everybody wants to talk about. Now, the cool functional part of what I do is this connected vehicle side. And so you see this little DSRC, Dedicated Short Range Communication. Essentially, the government in 1999, the U.S. government started working on um, putting a, uh, a type of technology in place that allows cars to talk to each other and talk to the roadside. Um, so um, that's what I work on. Because here's a role for the local governments now, because if they are able to install uh, equipment on the side of the road that can take signals from cars that are all talking to each other, then the local governments can do all kinds of cool stuff that I'm going to tell you about. So those are the differences, and I sort of set them up as two separate things, because this is a role for our local governments and for our folks who are managing supply chain and folks who are doing um, that kind of work. Um, and automated is, is something that the that the automotive manufacturers are doing. And so there's less for us to participate in there. 
Does that make sense? All right. Um, so uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation and the automotive industry has come up with what they call five different levels of automation. And uh, th this is how they define that. And uh, so it's kind of self-explanatory, but the idea is that you go from zero to five, and five is the most automated, and zero is what I drive. <coughs> Probably what you drive, too. What most people drive. All right, crazy talk, zero to, zero to five. So when you see that in the news, if you ever see that in the news, that's what that's about. <coughs> Okay, technical problem. All right, so um, so uh, an interesting topic, and okay, there we go. An interesting topic is, so recently you may have heard uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation and the federal, and, and Congress, the, the federal Congress, has um, recently decided to uh, overtake local legislation. So what has happened is, because a lot of states and local agencies are wanting to engage in the whole um, in the whole automated driving thing uh, world, and they can't really. So they've started to make all these laws enabling the use of automated vehicles. And really, um, you don't need a law enabling that because you can just do it. Right? <laughs> if there's no law that says you can, you don't need a law that says you can. Um, so what has happened is we've had about 15 or 20 different states in our country start to make all these laws, and the laws are a little bit different in each state. And this represents a problem, as you might imagine, for the automotive manufacturers, because now they have to make like cars that work differently in every state, <laughs> and this becomes a problem. So the federal government took over, and, and the, it has passed. There's a law that has passed the House and has not yet passed the Senate, but probably will. Probably by Christmas time, we'll have a full-fledged national law structure that says that states can't make laws um, enabling or having to do with automated vehicles. So look for that. So that's kind of exciting. <laughs> Um, and also the federal government, the U.S. Department of Transportation is, is putting out guidelines for um, requirements for safety as well. And those are out. All right, so um, as Helen said, this technology is not in the future. We know Tesla um, has a level four slash five, um, uh, depends on who you talk to, um, capable, uh, vehicle capable of driving without a, a well, they, they want someone in the driver, but you know, they don't have to steer. Uh, and then also I work with a company called Starsky Robotics, and so this is sort of interesting for supply chain folks. Starsky and a handful of other companies are actually have, um, actually have um, driverless and, uh, and, and automated um, commercial vehicles, trucks, for moving goods, which is pretty cool. Actually, if you go to their site, starsky.io right there, you can actually watch them watch the truck driving across Florida's Turnpike, if you're familiar with that road. <coughs> and, and from the backside, you can tell where it is, but Florida's Turnpike, they're a client of ours, and you know they don't show me that because <laughs> they don't want any liability, right? But it's going on on the roads. It's going on on the roads right now. So go check out that website because it's pretty cool, and that kind of work will be impactful to you as you plan how to move goods, um, probably um, in addition to the connected aspect of goods movement. All right, so um, there are different types of connected vehicles as well. So there's the one that the government set up, which is called DSRC, and then there's also 5G. There's different ways the cars can communicate over different networks. This is the timeline for the government one, which is kind of boring unless you live in D.C. So um, that, that's being worked. That's being solidified right now. Um, the, the U.S. DOT estimate is that if the rule is passed saying the cars have to be able to communicate with each other, that the uptake of the technology will be roughly this, is that by 20, 2022, we'll have a 100% uptake. I think it's, it'll be a little bit farther out, but that's a rough estimate of what that would be. So that is, if the, if the, US, Depart if, if the US Department of Tra Transportation mandates that this can happen, that we would probably have um, new vehicle uptake um, it, by, you know, probably by 2025 at this point. And how that works is the U.S. Department of Transportation, specifically NHTSA, which is the National Highway Safety, it's a safety group in U.S. Department of Transportation, they're allowed to mandate things in cars. So, for example, airbags, seat belts, all that is, is mandated, right? So, um, so we could mandate this type of communication. It's estimated that, uh, that this mandate, if the uptake gets, is, is, is at 100% that we will be able to 
eliminate roughly 84% of all fatal crashes. So basically by the time my kids, well, my younger kid drives, we won't have car crashes will not be a thing that we deal with, right? And so 84% of non-impaired crashes, we have about 40,000 crashes per year. So that's a, those, those are big numbers, right? That's pretty cool. Um, there's, a, there's a thing called zero fatalities. Um, it's called Vision Zero. And we developed this a long time ago. Some brilliant person actually tried to call it zero vision, which I always thought was kind of funny. <laughs> like, no, that's the opposite of what we're trying to do. It's a vision zero, and then that's moving towards no, no fatalities with cars. So with the connected vehicles, we can do that. And with the automated vehicles, you know, it illuminates human error. Human error makes up about 95% of all crashes. So if we can take the person out of the equation, because, um, you know, I, I know someone here is like, I, you know, I want to drive. I don't want to give up driving. There's always that. <laughs> but the, the reality is that the person is the problem 95% of the time. I mean, people suck and people suck at driving. And that's, I mean, we're just not as good as machines. I mean, we do. And it's just, that's just how it is. Yeah. So, Sam, Suzanne, basically what's going to happen here is that the DSRCs are going to control the flow of traffic, control the speeds, without us having any control over that. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so that, that, so that's sort of like the that's um, that's longer term. Um, so, what will happen is in the shorter term, when vehicles can communicate with each other. That, let me bring that to my next okay. slide. So, there are applications that we can use for this, and there are thousands of them. I I picked six because some client would like this when I made the slide. So, <laughs> so it's kind of arbitrary. Um, the top two applications that we can use when connect when cars can talk to each other. And to the infrastructure, the top two types of crashes, the most fatal, there are two of them. One of them is um, intersections. So as you're driving, just be careful with this. And the reason this happens is because, um, basically because there are forces from four, from four sides all coming at each other, right? And that, for physics, that's a, right, that's a challenge. And um, so intersections are number one, that's about 42% of crashes. And when we have equipment at intersections that communicate between the infrastructure and the cars, we can know where the cars are coming. So if I know some idiot is going to drive through the intersection, I can warn all the other cars to stop. You know, and, 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 I, and so the question that I always get is, is that right that everyone's going to stop it? You know, that, that's not fair. The answer is, I don't want to be dead. I care less about fair, more about living. So if I'm going to slow down an intersection because someone wants to drive through, I'm cool with that, all right? So, so that's the, that's, um, so all kinds of cool applications around intersections. Um, another one is um, priority. So when you're doing supply chain management, there's a thing called intersection priority where you can prioritize. Let's say I live near the Amazon um, uh, distribution facility. I could prioritize my corridor along that way to allow freight, um, freight movement through because that's what I need to do with that corridor. If I have a bus corridor, I need to move people through, I can prioritize an intersection for that for buses. So there are all kinds of fantastic stuff that we can do with intersections, and I'm so excited about. Okay, so the second big application that has less to do with the infrastructure, and this is accidental lane departure. So also be careful with accidental lane departure when you're driving. It's the second. It's for another 42% of crashes. And this is more about cars talking to each other. So if I accidentally go out of a lane, um, my car will know that there's another car nearby by virtue of the GPS. We also have lane keep assist. That's something that we have now that's not DSRC based and not communications based. It's like uh, radar and, and LIDAR that knows where the cars are running. Okay, this is about the GPS aspect of it. But it's all the same. So in the sense that it's going to prevent about 42% of crashes. So right now there's no plan to control the whole flows of everything or anything like that. It's about doing discrete applications to help manage these giant, inter these giant crash types. We can manage those two giant crash types to take it 82% out, 84%, whatever the number is. Some, some big giant number, right? And we'll take that. So ultimately, when, when everything becomes automated, which is quite a while, I expect to be quite a while till we have uh, every car automated. Cars live about 10 years. There are about maybe 10, 12 years. There are about 250 million cars on the road. So you can do some math and think it's going to take a long time to replace that whole fleet with automated. So we're a long way. It's certainly not in my career, probably not past that, where we have some giant automated. In fact, I think what will, what will leapfrog that is that I'm also working with the flying cars. Have you seen these flying cars? <laughs> Coolest thing ever. I kid you not. This is actually happening, right? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. 
no, this is, no, this is real. This is very true. Um, real. There are like six companies working on their drones that can carry people. So they're actually commercially ready. The problem is the Federal um, Aviation Authority hasn't figured out how to do the laws for that. So I think what actually happens before we have like this big thing on the ground with the with you know everything coordinated, I think we're flying. I really do. So I got the spreadsheet I says I have 17 more years left to do this. <laughs> so I think that's just right at the edge of the 17 years. So we'll see what happens. But I think that that's I think that that's really what's going to happen. Check it out. Uber has one. I think it's called I can't remember the name of it. Uber has one and there are like five other ones. If you want to look that up, you can do that. They're they're testing them in um, in Virginia, they're testing some, they're, and I think they're testing some in Florida and in Texas. Pretty sweet, huh? <clears throat> All right, let me fly through some of these applications. Interrupt me, give me a time warning. Um, speed harmonization, that, that's less about, um, as your question was, it's less about um, making the cars do stuff. It's about uh, traffic engineers tell me that we can improve flow dramatically up and downstream on, uh, on a highway when we can let folks know that there's a slowdown up ahead. So we can, drop, we can let cars know that if you drop to 30 miles an hour now, you're going to more efficiently use less gas and you're going to get to your destination faster if this whole group of cars is moving 30 and rather than drive 60 and then come to a stop at the edge. So it's, it's called speed harmonization, and that would be about letting the drivers know that this is the speed that we think that you should go, and they have to make the choice on their own, right? Okay, so wrong way driving. Um, so there are not a lot of wrong way driving fatalities, but when they happen, they're almost always fatal, almost always, because two opposing forces at 60 miles an hour, and it almost always, in, or 60 is probably 90 or 100, really, because it almost always involves alcohol also. So it becomes political and it becomes fatal, and those two things are a reason that we are under demand to develop applications that prevent that. So what we might do is let a driver know that there's, another, that there's an idiot coming who's drunk, and so you should pull over. Uh, and then we can also let the, we can, through the system, through the traffic management centers that all the agencies have, um, if we see that on a camera, for example, we could notify the police and at the same time notify all the vehicles through um, a communications-based system that they need to slow down. Um, traffic signal systems, I talked to you about some of the cool intersection applications and if you have any questions about that with supply chain management, you can ask them. Traffic signal priority, this is with that first aid. Um, I mentioned um, commercial vehicles as a priority, I mentioned um, buses as a priority, also a priority in many signals would be um, emergency vehicles, right, because they would get priority. We shut down, the system could shut down the signals and let the um, other vehicles through. All right. Multimodal integration, so this is kind of cool because all, because communications could be on trains, buses, anything on the surface. So we can do a lot of work in optimizing those systems so that they work together better. And also same with pedestrians and bicyclists. All right, um, so I'm nearing, I have 10, I have 15 slides, this is 10. Um, data, so this is the coolest thing and this is the, one of the most important things for, all, for most of my clients because we're gonna get more data from a connected vehicle than any other source, single source in the history of the world. At 10 times, or 10 times a second, the, the vehicle will put off information about its location and have, there are like eight data points that are likely to be mandated. Um, and that'll come out every 10 seconds. It's, it's trajectory, it's location, it's um, uh, I, a couple other things that I'm not remembering right now. So the question is, what do we do with the data? And so this is a really cool um, problem um, opportunity for anyone who's studying any kind of data integration or any of that stuff, um, because we could, I advise my clients to either, they could take a little bit of it, they could take all of it, they could sell it, they could buy it, they could throw it out, they could do whatever they want with the data, but there's basically this huge mass of data available for our DOT clients. So that's something cool to think about, and I'll leave you with that. Then maybe I can get another slide. All right, so, so the next slide, if it comes up, is about smart cities. And so smart cities is this concept here about, about um, what happens if we integrate everything in a city? What happens if we have trash cans that can communicate their full so that the trash trucks can better coordinate when they come down the road and coordinate all that with safety and mobility? So, um, so this is a concept that, that a lot of folks in cities are working on. So if you're doing any work with cities or, um, 
for those folks, this is something that they're looking at, is how to integrate parking, how do you let people know that there are parking spaces available. And so what we're looking at is how do we bring all these data sources, because there are all these fantastic data sources. Um, there are parking lot security, the goods movements companies. How do we put them all into one single source in the middle and use some kind of analytics tool to get some usable information um, for, for the clients here on the city side? And vice versa, you know, maybe they sell it back to the private side after they've integrated it. Um, so that's something to think about. All right, so let me do some, um, I'm almost done here, some Atlanta-specific uh, discussions. So one that's not on here that I'm personally working on is Georgia DOT. This week I kicked off a project for Georgia DOT that has an acronym, so Helen's cringing. It's called SPAT. And SPAT in traffic terms means signal, phase, and timing. And what this means is that the traffic signal can put off data about, um, about its phase, about is it red, yellow, or green, and how much longer is the red, yellow, or green aspect of it. This is called the SPAT. So Georgia DOT has hired us to um, outfit equipment along some road that's not up here. It's in the north, uh, northeast corridor of the city, and we're going to have 60 intersections outfit up there, um, like by Peachtree Corners, like around there. Um, with equipment that will export the signal phase and timing from the signals to vehicles so that vehicles can um, move better or learn from that, um, from that data. So, um, so that's going on, so we're, we started that this week. That's pretty exciting. Um, also, on North Avenue in Atlanta, uh, the city hired Atkins to help coordinate this deployment of all kinds of these, uh, these fantastic technologies. We'll see how useful it all is. Uh, it's mainly just, th this is mainly like a show-off opportunity. I'm not sure that, that what we're doing here actually has some, you know, solid outcomes yet, but we'll see. Um, these are some of the applications. Smart street lighting, so why have a light on if nobody's around, right? That doesn't make sense. So, um, um, and they have coordinated traffic signals, so that means the signal will be aware of the things that are around it and adapt accordingly. Um, let's see what else. Smart data, as I mentioned. Um, apps. Connectivity, we can also connect phone apps to signals so that you can send a signal to the intersection that you're there and it'll change. We'll be aware of everything. Uh, smart trash receptacles, um, and basically everything connected to everything. That's the concept of North Ave. So if you get up there to check it out. Ponds Market. Ponds Market. All right, so I guess this is a more detailed. That's the corridor you were talking about? Mm -hmm. This is not, this is the this North is Avenue one. The other corridor one, I'll have to get you those intersections. So is it actually working that we can walk in front yes. of it and it's going to stop? Yeah. yeah. Anybody want to go with me and walk in front of it? <laughs> <laughs> not, a, not a midterm for all of it, now's the time to do it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so I'm getting to the end, and I'll just tell you that something that's interesting about this slide is it shows the integration of MARTA. And so that seems like so what to every person who doesn't work in transportation. But the so what of that is, is that it's actually very challenging from, a, uh, from an agency perspective to get those groups to work together, to get MARTA to work together with, um, with GOT, G, with GDOT, Georgia DOT, any of those agencies, any of those acronyms, they're really hard to get to work together. Mm -hmm. They're all their own revenue source. They're all their own board of directors. They all have their own agendas. And anytime you can get any of them to do something together, it's a really big accomplishment. It sounds pathetic, but it's actually it's true. Awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so that that so that's um, so that's the end. So, um, if did I was I basic? Was that did I get? Yeah. I, I, I guess we have to let them. Cause okay. We're used to it being very technical, so she's done a really good job of keeping. No, I think it was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we put back that one slide again. Which one? Is that what the vehicle looks like by coat, or is it the bus that's going to um, so, so, so this is the question. So the, the question is, what does it look like? May um, I make your question a little bit broader? Can you yeah. pull up the one from North Avenue? Yeah. The, the, the bus from North I'm Avenue? I'm going to try. This one? When I go down, I want to make sure if I got people with me. I'm yeah. So, so call us first, and we can help with that. But the interesting thing that you're going to want to do is get the apps to interact with the to interact with the lighting, the light equipment. But generally how it looks is a question that I get a lot because uh, it's actually a really great question. How does the vehicle interface with the human who's using this stuff and what does it look like? And so there are all different ways about how it looks. Um, 
all um, older model vehicles can interact with um, can can have equipment on them. You don't have to have a new vehicle to do this. A lot of times, it's a uh, um, there's an interface from the phone to the equipment to the vehicle. Um, sometimes there's no interface. Um, some manufacturers are looking at warning drivers um, with visual, with audio, and also with haptic seats. Have you seen like shaky seats? Like if there's a problem on the left hand side. The left butt's gonna wiggle, and if there's a problem on the right hand side, the right butt. Will it's like it's very cool, uh, but basically that, that that kind of thing is not standardized. That's up to the individual automotive manufacturer at the OEM level. Um, maybe BMW notices that people, so their clients like butt cheek shaking more, and somebody else likes, you know, somebody else, you know, likes audio. So it, it's going to be different for each one. So we can lose weight while we're driving. Something I don't know. <laughs> Right, so this is called, typically this is called lane keep assistance, right, because the idea is that it's there so that you don't back into them, yeah? So the outcome is the same. Uh, the approach is the difference. And so that's sensor-based, and that's also wonderful, and that data that we get from that sensor that caused that can be fed into a centralized system on the car to link with the GPS data to give us a whole picture of everything that's around the car ins inside the vehicle. Can actually know that information and then, ex and then share that information back to the traffic management center or share it back to some coordinating entity. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Shoot. So why was this the target area? Can I just, oh, can I just interject? Of course for videotaping, can you repeat the questions? Yes. So we can catch an eye. Yes. So the question is, why did we? Why did the city of Atlanta choose North Avenue? And I have to. Do you know? Yeah. Uh, this particular quarter was was selected because of the accident rate, because they had so many accidents, and one of them is they're giving the one of those uh, icons you showed was with the emergency vehicles. Right. That it's going to give them that prioritization. <clears throat> to come through if there's an emergency vehicle and slows down the other vehicles because apparently at that at that intersection they have had it's one of the highest incident um, locations in downtown Atlanta. And and, and I and I'll, let me get your question in one second. I just want to um, correct Helen ever so slightly. In the, in this industry, we don't say the word accident. Oh. We actually say the word, do you know what it is? What is it? Crash. 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 Okay. And the reason why we don't use the word accident is because accident somehow implies that there was like no, nothing you could do to prevent it. And in fact, the vast majority of crashes are things that you can do to prevent it. So, um, not, not to be, <laughs> again, I, I'm all about language. Language shapes how we think about things. So I just want to be, you know. This is her world. This is my world. If I said that at USDOT, I'd be kicked out of the building. Yeah. So, so just to shape how you're thinking, because you, you all are going to have a lot of control about crashes. I mean, so, okay, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, you know, this week the big news was that head-on collision, I think it was on 285. Just think this kind of technology could be the type of technology that could have saved, there were like four people killed yeah. just this week in a head-on collision. It's all the time. Yeah. Hey, and, 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 and I'll get to your question in a minute. I haven't forgotten that you asked me a question. I tell all my teenager friends and all this, so I'm just going to tell you. So there are some basic things you can do to help be safe, and this is not the point of this, but since I have the platform. <laughs> so so m uh, most fatalities happen at night. So if you don't need to be out at night, I mean, I sound like a crazy old mother, I'm, and I'm not that old yet, but like that is true. There's, that's just a factual truth, is that people are drunk at night, and if you want to like, cut down your risks of getting killed, don't be, avoid being out at night when you can, right? The other thing is that, um, and, and you all are maybe just, just past this age, but you know that, that, that traffic fatalities are the absolute number one killers, and it's not even close for young people, right? That's it. It's not cancer. It's not heart disease. You're, you're most likely to get killed in a car crash. I, I'm shocked that you don't know this. This is shocking to me. Does someone tell you this in driver's ed? This is absolutely true. It kills young people. It, I mean, that's the number one killer of young people. All right, so another thing that young people can do, other than being out after dark, I mean, you have to be out at dark. I don't mean to be unrealistic, but be careful, because that's when the crashes happen. The other thing is that when you have another young person in the car with you, 
almost every fatality with young people, there's another young person in the car. Watch me, because the next time you hear it on the news, there's going to be another young person in the car with someone who died. And it's not because you're like, even if you're the most cautious, careful young person, which I don't think is physiologically possible because we know that our brains don't develop that part until we're older, right? So let's pretend that that's not true. You're going to get distracted by the idiot next to you because you're an idiot because we're all idiots when we're young. That's just how, I mean, that's how it is, right? And so e even if you like, even if you're not an idiot, the guy next to you is an idiot and they're going to like say, change the channel, do whatever. Someone in the car is an idiot and they're going to distract you and you're going to get in a crash. And, and, and so the way, you, the way you prevent that is until you get in a lot of hours, right? Malcolm Gladwell says 10,000 hours, right, until you get to be good at something. So until you get in all your lot of hours of practicing, which may be 43 for me, I'm not sure, um, avoid like having other young people in the car with you. I mean, it's, 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 it's really kind of simple, and many states have laws about that now, too. But that's just how it is. Um, so, uh, so, so watch out for that. All right, go ahead. You had a question? Yeah, how do you agree plans and target, I guess, those who are worried more about privacy? Because you do have to be connected to other cars. Right, right. Right, so privacy is one of my favorite questions. I get it all the time. The question is about privacy. Typically, when I get this question, it's usually a guy who asks me, and he usually has three phones in front of him. <laughs> so my answer is like, come on, man. <laughs> so <laughs> the reality is that if, if you have a phone, you've essentially given away more privacy than a system like this could, 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 um, could, could take. Right. Um, so, and, and actually, if we talk about the DSRC uh, system specifically, it, ha it has an inherent. Pri it's very, very hard to break the privacy because the mandated signal that it sends, it sends like eight pieces of data from vehicle to infrastructure. It sends out eight pieces of data. None of those data points are related to the person who's driving or to the car. So that is, it's eight points of data about the location, about the trajectory, about the wipers, about the brakes, whatever. None of those say that any of those aspects of the driving are related to that car. They just, it's a piece of data that goes out and it says it's from, it's from a car. It doesn't say it's from your car, or it doesn't say it's from you. It's a car. So that, that, that data stream is unable to link it to any, to any vehicle. So that's not to say that someone is going to hack this and find a way around it. It is to say that I am somewhat skeptical, not of you, but generally when people ask me that because they're trying to trap me, and my answer is, I mean, this is my life versus my privacy, which I've already given up on the three phones that I am. I mean, you know, come and break. So my choice is to, to be alive rather than, you know, worry about, because Waze knows where I am. Google knows where I am. All those guys know where I am. And so if Georgia DOT also does, which I know is not technically, um, really, really technically challenging, and I know Georgia DOT does not have the funds or the wherewithal to try me anyway. And, uh, so uh, it, it's hard. And that's a great question, and I don't mean to minimize your, your question. Okay. I have many more follow-up questions. Okay. Um, would that minimize, I guess, the insurance policy? Great question. Brilliant question. She asked about insurance. So think about this for a second because this is a great question because when people ask me this, they don't realize this. Insurance companies are in trouble now, right? Because if we have no crashes, they profit when you crash. Right. They wouldn't be selling you the policy if they didn't profit when you crashed, right? So, um, so, so we, if we don't have crashes, then we at least don't have crash insurance. Right? I mean, some, some people ask me, like, well, the insurance company is helping with this? Well, not really, because they profit from our crashes. <clears throat> but, I mean, that's, I don't mean to make them out to be big, bad, anything, because that's not true. They, they have a job, and, you know, they do their thing. So, um, so we will lose, we will not, probably not, we will probably have much less insurance um, for, for crashes. Yeah. Hello, sorry. Yeah. Um, what about the, I guess, priority? Because some of us do have to, you know, get to work on time, get to school on time, and if they're being, like, not a priority versus the buses. The Great question. So the question is, how, if the signal prioritized, how do I make sure that I get to work on time if freight is prioritized in that quarter? And that's a question we were talking about earlier with regard to ethics and automated vehicles also. How will machines prioritize that? Right? So I don't know exactly. Um, it's going to be up to the individual departments of transportation who manage traffic flow to, to determine what's best. Probably there would not be a, let's say, 
I, I'm just imagining a commute into DC through like Old Town Alexandria, which has 19 lights, not that I counted. Like I'm pretty <laughs> sure that during the rush hour traffic inbound, there's not going to be freight, freight signal priority on that road, right? Um, but that would probably be up to the individual departments of transportation to manage that particular part. Or you probably would not be driving on a freight prioritized road during the freight prioritized time, would be my guess. But that, that's a great question. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> um, well, we will have to work, um, I guess, with mobile um, companies, I guess, you know, get connections with maybe Metro or Verizon for those apps. Right. Okay. So this is a fantastic question. And it's about uh, the role of the wireless industry in this. Um, and so for DSRC, which is the, the, like the government one, the wireless industry is not involved in this. Actually, for DSRC, it's its own wireless network. And so the wireless industry does not like this. Qualcomm is actually at the White House on a regular basis arguing with me about this uh, because they want to do it. Um, but the, and it's fun. I mean, I don't, it, either way, it's good. And they're going to do it probably how you describe, like with apps on phone. You know, 5G is very, very fast. The problem is that um, then we are beholden to Qualcomm and Verizon and Sprint. And so our, all of our local governments are now beholden to Qualcomm Horizon. It's actually Qualcomm owns all the, all the, the IP um, around in, in that space. So it's Qualcomm. So if, if indeed we do a mobile, um, well, Qualcomm's going to be rich. And, and I anticipate that's a uh, somewhat likely event. So that's a great question. And they will probably use apps as part of that interface. They will probably also see 5G wireless devices installed directly in vehicles at the factory because that's actually safer to carry a car. If you don't want a, car, a mobile device, is not a safety piece of safety equipment. Go ahead. Okay, so my question is a little bit. It's kind of out there. Have you seen um, the movie Out of Are you like? Yeah. Yeah. Are you trying to do something? No, I'm not. No. Are you? Great question. So there are two parts to the question. One is what's the cost to the consumer, and the second question is can you turn it off? So remember I was explaining that if NHTSA mandates this, so let's just go with the NHTSA mandate. It's an easier answer. If NHTSA <coughs> mandates this, imagine it's, it's a, imagine an airbag. The cost of the, the cost to a DS, a piece of connected vehicle equipment in a vehicle right now is like hundred dollars. And how this works is that generally over the last 20 years. The price of vehicles has remained relatively, like, completely flat compared to increasing cost of living and GDP and all that. So that, like, goes up, and the price of vehicles are relatively flat. 
and also relative to the amount of equipment that's in it. So what happens is the automotive industry has very small profit margins, and um, that's how it is, and so they likely they will eat the cost of this, but um, if they didn't eat the cost, it would be about $100, give or take. Okay, so, it would, but you probably won't see it. It's, it's an unfunded mandate, it'll be a mandate, it'll be in every car, car and likely the automotive industry will take the hit. What's the second question? And the second question is, can I shut it off? Yes. So, um, I'm sure that someone can shut it off. It's going to be as hard as disabling your airbag. Because the point is that we all have it so that we all don't die. Um, same with airbags. You can disable your airbag. No, it's not legal and it's not smart. But it can be done. Just cut the blue wire. <laughs> <laughs> this is being recorded, right? Yeah. <laughs> but send here stays here. <laughs> Are we planning for the federal government to dictate freight priority in terms of neutrality? Right. So the question is, would the government dictate freight priority? Federal government dictate freight priority? I, I can comfortably say no. I, I, so from my perspective, I have not seen any inkling, any hint, smell, sniff, whiff of the federal government having any interest in getting involved with any local stuff at all. Um, I don't think they want to, and I don't think they can afford to. There's just, there's just not that much. That, that is expensive. <coughs> Doing that, what you're proposing, is very expensive, and so it's hard. Will it be local governments? Or because my concern is you get private companies wanting their freight prioritized more than right. private companies. And that might happen. So the question is, what if there's a private company? And, and there's actually been discussion about about having auctions for, for traffic signals. Isn't that be funny? You could like outbid the guy next to you. Like, how bad do you really want to get through this, right? <laughs> and, and and so we have express lanes are kind of like that too. That's why I said it's the right? managed lane system. It's the managed lane system, right? And, and and maybe that's bad, maybe that's good. I've not seen that. Um, uh, if, if Amazon does own some big facility somewhere and they need a freight prioritized corridor, quite frankly, it's been my experience that DOTs will work with big companies like that in order to increase the tax base. I've not seen like private sector companies duking it out for an intersection, for example. But I, I mean, private sector and transportation is a thing, um, and it's um, somewhat reasonable because actually, do you all know about the gas tax? Mm -hmm. You know how that works? Anyone who doesn't wants me to explain that? Yes. Please. Yes. Okay, I'll be quick for everyone who does, okay? Basically, our gas tax has not changed ever. I think the last gas tax increase was I don't know, 1953 or something insane like that, right? So in the meantime, it turns out that roads still need to be repaid. Um, and, and the other <coughs> problem is that cars have gotten wildly more efficient. And so since we tax on the gas that we buy, if my car uses less gas, therefore we get less gas tax. So our gas tax, the revenue collection has dropped down dramatically. So we have much less revenue from gas tax. And so we have much less money to rebuild our roads. And so this is why managed lanes and tolling and all those kind of things that everyone thinks is a double tax and the robbery blind and all that. Actually, it's necessary because we have no other way of paving our roads. Because uh, there's no revenue from the gas tax. It hasn't gone up and the, the amount that's increased per, you know, per gallon is decreasing. And then if we have electric vehicles, we have no way to pay for paving the roads. There's no gas being used. So what do we do then? Pay well, that's just mismanagement of the books in Congress. Because the trucking industry pays for all the road tax, it's supposed to go for the infrastructure. Is that what you think? Oh, I, uh, <laughs> it's supposed to, but all those IU, IOU numbers in that box have been taken out to go somewhere else. So trucks, now. just FYI, trucks do most of the damage on the road. One of the cool applications that I don't have up here is actually um, is called Way in Motion. Are you familiar with this? Mm -hmm. This is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. This is where we know um, from the electronic equipment on the vehicle how much it weighs and what it's supposed to weigh. Mm -hmm. And it has to be even. This is kind of cool for math people. Um, when a truck is, 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 it doesn't have an even balance, it basically destroys the roadway with this, um, with this, with this motion. So trucks actually do a vast amount of damage to the road and actually do pay less tax than, than we do. Um, so there's a lot of discussion. Many other countries have, have specific taxes just for trucks. So maybe it makes sense that Amazon buy a car or to prioritize the freight or buy a road. So do you foresee a problem in the future, like in net neutrality, where some of the smaller companies aren't able to get their breakthrough as much as that is? It could be. The question was, what about smaller companies who take the breakthrough? 
There are a lot of small freight companies. It's <coughs> very fun stuff, and it's not decided yet, so it's an opportunity for you to influence stuff. We've got time for one more question. Uh, my question is, I don't know what kind of smartphone are you using, but uh, which map do you use? Because, uh, so what do I prefer, I, uh, so the question is what navigation app do I prefer to use? I prefer to use Waze, and I picked that because many of my state DOT clients have arrangements with Waze. Y'all familiar with Waze? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, Check out Waze, W-A-Z-E, Waze, -E. Waze <coughs> owned by Google. Um, however, Google does not always have the Waze data in its map. Google is <coughs> kind of cool because it tells you what lanes be in right before you're turning, which is better about Google. Waze will have the crashes in it sooner and will export the data faster to my clients, so I prefer to use Waze. My additional question is really from Google map also. So what is the main difference between this system and the versus Google map? <coughs> between Waze and Google map? Uh, this system. Oh, this system Google. with Google Maps. So Google Maps only knows your your only knows the location of your phone. It also says if there's a slowdown or crash. It does. It does. It gets that reported to it from the, from the DOTs and then from sometimes from the ways from the users. Mm -hmm. This system would know that stuff without anyone else reporting it. It would understand that about your vehicle and could send that vehicle to the, to the traffic management center and then <coughs> to the phone. And stuff. So you don't have to do anything. You don't have to touch a screen. It knows. Make sense? All right. All right, just stay put before we wrap up. Just have a good hand.